action. Hi, everyone. I'm Beth Johnson, and with me, as always, is scientist Frank Marchese, and this is The Grudge Report, SETI Institute's science show following Star Trek Discovery's latest episodes. Spoilers abound, so if you still haven't watched the most recent episode, turn back while you still can. All right, let's get to it. So, Frank, what did you think of this week? Well, this week's show was interesting because it was basically the re-encounter between Michael and the crew of the USS mm -hmm. Discovery. We learn a bit about uh, what happened uh, before she arrived. But I, what I re truly prefer is when they decided to go to see Earth. I mean, it's the most interesting planet in the universe. So it's obviously exciting to see what happened 930 years later. Yeah, that was, I was kind of excited to see that, especially because we didn't know what the situation was. I, I didn't expect it to turn out the way that it was, but, you know, not having Starfleet there was kind of a shock, but not totally a shock because everything's upside down anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and we learn also about what truly really happened, some more details about this burn. I think that was interesting, interesting that we found out uh, that the burn um, the ship that detonated was only the ship which were into an active using the the warp core, so there was some probably a lot of ships that you survived. Yeah. Um, so that explains why it's not a complete and total decimation. Exactly. Although you know millions obviously died in it, and I I watching Saru try and lie his way through answering the questions was kind of. Not really his forte. I was, I was impressed. <laughs> <laughs> so she's, um, before, before um, finding the crew, Michael explained a bit, Fash, they, we, show the, we see the strategy that she used to find information mm -hmm. in, a, in a galaxy where it's almost impossible to move around. So she became a courier, right? Right. Which uh, maybe you can explain to our viewers what is a courier. Well, it looks like the couriers are people who trade in um, merchandise and information that other people find difficult to get. So they're the ones who have the dilithium to power their ships and, and all of that. And so they trade for information, they trade for dilithium, and they, they get the things that other people are looking for. So we see her in sort of a flashback of that past year, working to get different parts of the story, um, finding out what's happened to Starfleet, seeing who knows what and where she can get it from. And she's handed um, the one device from an, an NCC mm -hmm. ship that I didn't note the number. I'm sure someone else has noted it, but I don't need that information write in my head. <laughs> right, write it down. Yeah, I don't, I don't need all that information in my head. But so one of the things that she's, she's brought up is that she, they've received this message from a, an Admiral Senatal and that 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 person is at Earth and they should go to Earth. And so they have a spore drive so they can go to Earth really quickly. Can explain for our viewers here what is the spore drive again? Because it's one of the weirdest things, which is not really known by non-Star Trek fans. So, um, Stamets explains it in this episode and I mean really if you're watching this and you don't know what we're talking about why are you watching this but <laughs> uh, the spore drive is basically this this very strange extra dimensional space um, that's a it's a mycelium network so it's mushrooms it's spores shrooms things like that and uh, they've set up a system that allows them to basically travel through it and it's it's one of those things where if you can hold the map of it in your mind you can go places almost instantaneously and so their their engineer has figured this out and is basically the person who runs it because obviously you know in the first season they figured out that it was uh, really hurting the creature they were using to do it which was a giant tardigrade I miss I kind of miss the giant tardigrade I mean, it's an interesting technology, and that's why I wanted you to explain this, because imagine if you have that, we could move from any part of the, of the galaxy. The only thing we need is to have a map, basically, to have this yeah. 3D map, to be able to move from one point to another one. So that will make a species which has access to a technology like this, a truly uh, space-faring, uh, galaxies-faring species that will be yeah. capable of traveling anywhere they want. Yeah, they've they've used it to travel uh, a lot of very interesting places, including across dimensions. So, uh, not not a thing I would recommend. Mm -hmm. The mirror universe has not been good to Star Trek ever. 
So um, here they decide to reappear, mm -hmm. not in front of Earth, because they have no idea what to see. So they decide to reappear behind a very small planet called Saturn. Right. Well, they wanted to stay out of scanning range. So I was kind of curious to see what they what they thought scanning range would mean. And so obviously for for what the technology was when they left, um, it would have been out at Saturn. I don't know if that's still the case. Uh, we never really find out how if, if they were picked up on the way in. But I also kind of thought it was funny how quickly they went from Saturn to Earth. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, uh, I mean, how fast were you going, guys? <laughs> for us, uh, we have a current technology. It takes several years for a spacecraft to go to from Earth to uh, to Saturn. And generally, the it's not a, a straight line. They have to use some complex orbital elements to do this. And usually, with and Venus. slingshotting off of other planets uh, and everything. Yeah, no problem with the. USS Discovery, straight nope. line, straight in front of Earth's atmosphere. Right. Which is, I stopped this image when we see the first time Earth because I was like very interested in seeing any change in the plate tectonic, the distribution of the of the continental crust. Well, yeah, because a thousand years would make a, a significant difference. I mean, not a huge, it's not a huge amount of time geologically, but you should still see some differences. Yeah. I did but not see anything visually. I, no, I, I doubt they went into that kind of detail. It it would have been cool. Um, I was more fascinated with the defense system because, you know, it was a tech thing, and I, I kind of went, oh, what have they got here? So, <laughs> so it's kind of a Starlink network for defense. Yes. <laughs> That's the way it is, right? <laughs> right, right, exactly. It is a bunch of satellites basically making a fence. <laughs> exactly. So that was that was wild. I thought that was that was kind of a, a cool change. I did like that they show you that there is an advancement in technology. That it's not just the ship and everything that is is out of date, but how they relate to the new technology is also very out of date. Like they get shot at, and it goes right through the shields like it's <laughs> tissue paper. Yeah. You know, there's there's not even a, our shields are gone. It's like, well, what? Uh, reroute all the power, and you know, it's you can't keep up because that. That 900 years makes a difference. It's like for us, if we travel 900 years back, I think we will bring technology that will surprise. It, it wouldn't make sense to, to anybody. Yeah, yeah. It, it would definitely, it, you know, even if you went back like 60 years and took an iPhone, people would stare at you funny. So, you know, it's like everything you've ever wanted to know is, is right here. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, I'm glad that they've kind of touched on the fact that technology would have changed mm -hmm. pretty radically in that in that nearly thousand years. So that was good to see. Um, but then the, the politics did not change that much. At the end, it's still well, the same complication. After you were, and you were right because you wanted to know who wasn't in the Federation anymore, like who wasn't in the the Alliance, and Earth was all we're not. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you were not wrong that this happened. Uh, whether or not that had any bearing on the flag from the first week, I don't know. But at least we found one uh, civilization that is definitely out of, of the Federation. So that was so the name of Earth. question now? answered. What's the name of Earth? You remember? United Earth? United Earth. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So it's, it's United Earth. And uh, yeah. So so it's a very kind of uh, centric self preservating system that they created after the apocalypse, which is in this case the disappearance of uh, the lithium and, um, and the economical and uh, political system. So right. it kind of closed itself, basically. Uh, yeah, they, they closed themselves off, they became self-sufficient, and uh, was it they talked about uh, dilithium had become unstable, yeah. which I thought that was again that's really interesting or no it becomes inert and so and then the warp cores explode so i'm kind of curious as to i mean again it's all star trek science but i'd really i'd really want more answers to this question so i'm, I'm glad the we physics of the destruction of a, on an element like the lithium in yeah i mean how does how does an element just suddenly go inert <laughs> will we will see so. maybe something related to the space-time continuum <laughs> <laughs> don't try to think too much on this. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to think about the space-time continuum. It hurts my head. So, so Earth is not uh, a peaceful place again. Well, it's it's 
peaceful within its own literal oh, bubble but mm -hmm. it's not really peaceful with anything else. It doesn't, they're supposedly being raided for their dilithium and they're fighting a group of raiders who are coming to, to claim everything. And, and you know, everybody they seems to, human. they don't look human, they look like bugs. And everybody seems to think, everybody seems to know Discovery exists. I think it's hilarious that people keep coming in and going, so you're not with Discovery? It's like, Wow, guys, you're you're not maintaining secrecy at all. <laughs> Everybody knows you're here. They don't know why, but they know you're here. So that was I I liked that. I, I like that little kind of tick at you know we have all the information we need on your ship. Again, our technology is so far advanced That's that we know everything. Yeah. We know everything that you have. So that once again, yeah, they have probably the sensors, the instrument that can read the space time continuum, know when they move around. I mean, we don't know the technology in very clear details, but there is probably signatures of a spaceship that goes at the speed of close to the speed of light or above it. So they probably have all those instruments capable of detecting this. Mm -hmm. So Wayne, the power, the kind of the radar, and happened to be in fact a human person. We spoiled this, but, um, and he's coming from Titan. Yeah, this was, I think, my favorite revelation of the whole episode for me as a as a planetary scientist, to to have him say, you know, oh well, I'm from Titan, and and they're all well, you know, Titan is supposed to be self sufficient. To know we had an accident at a liquid hydrocarbon research base, and I'm all liquid hydrocarbons. Okay, yes, that makes sense. This is so cool, and you know, they're they don't have tillable soil because they they've had pro you know this has become a problem and. They're, you know, it's impacted their habitats. And, and of course, all of that makes sense because obviously Titan, while it is very Earth-like in the fact that it has weather patterns and it rains and there's streams and lakes, it is not because they have so much methane that actually those lakes and rain and all of that actually contains a lot of methane. So there's a lot of these hydrocarbons around and uh, so I thought that was really interesting how they actually tied all of that into it and gave us this whole community on Titan. And, you know, that revelation for me was, like I said, the most interesting part of the show, just because from a science standpoint, I was really excited to see that touched upon since that is a, a, a place in our solar system where we would like to find life. And if not find life, you know, it's one of those far-fetched, well, maybe we could, you know, put habitats up there like Mars or something and and that would be that would be how we go so it's kind of cool to see that tie-in for me. I think it's very cool that uh, Star Trek and a lot of other science fiction series kind of follow the progress we make in exploring the solar system. I mean we talk about Star Trek today but if you look at the expanse for instance they talk about asteroids the shape the structure of asteroids which are based on true facts that we discover five ten years ago so in this case, they describe Titan and some of the uh, scientific exploration of Titan based on what we really know about Titan at the moment, which are nice. So you can learn about the solar system by watching the Star Trek. Just A little bit, yeah. I mean, there we've had. I mean, even this last week, we've had news on Titan. So I thought that was, I thought that was well timed. I mean, these are shot in advance, so for that to kind of coincide was pretty interesting. Um, so what we was had the two, news on Titan last week? We had two stories on Titan last week. One was the discovery of um, a hydrocarbon, a tiny hydrocarbon, called cyclo cyclopropenylidene, and it's a C three H two. It's a loop uh, molecule, so it 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 is a closed loop so like benzene is mm -hmm. um and it's very small and we've not found it in the atmosphere of a planet before we've only found it in interstellar space because interstellar space is too cold for reactions and this is a pretty reactive molecule and so they found it in titan's upper atmosphere uh using cassini data so cassini again the gift that keeps on giving and cassini they, spacecraft and not cassini the researcher director of the observatory right <laughs> right so <laughs> The Cassini spacecraft continues to just give us, you know, there's just so much to be to be analyzed from it. There was so much data sent back. And so they found this molecule and they're kind of curious as to how it can interact, how it might possibly um, interact with other gases in the atmosphere and possibly make what they consider to be building blocks for DNA and RNA and, you know, lead the way for 
more complex organic molecules. So that was that just happened this last week. And there was another paper that came out that talked about uh, the formation of craters on Titan and how the weather resurfaces the planet and the similarity to how the earth processes work. So the rain and the rivers and, and all of that and how that could also have an impact on the possibility of life on Titan because it does have all of these processes that can move soil and that kind of thing around. So- Erosion, uh, basically, yeah. Yeah, so it, it was kind of, it was a good timing on the, the part of the episode. So I guess I had Titan on the brain going into watching it and because I had just, you know, done these two stories. And so to have it kind of come up in the show was was perfect timing, really. So I, I really, that was great. <laughs> Even if it wasn't intentional, it was cool. So maybe the next episode where we will see these Titan colonies. Hopefully, I don't know. It may that happen. would That would be neat. I would like that. I don't know how, where it's going to go from here. Um, because of course we were introduced to a new character this week. Um, oh, it seems uh, seems to be sort of the theme of the first few episodes is how many new characters can we cram in here? Mm -hmm. And now we have a, a new team member who is from the current time and brings back a, a Star Trek species that um, would not have been heard of in the original series timeline, which would be when Discovery is. Um, but comes much later during DS9 days, and that is the the trill. Oh. And those are the the symbiotic uh, species where the trill actually lives for a long time and just changes uh, trill bodies, essentially. And so what has happened is Admiral Senatal, and I'm, I'm a little unclear as to which was the trill. So is Admiral Senatal a trill? I'm guessing, and then- yeah, I guess. That, and the species went to another body. And then Mira. the symbiote that, that has all those memories is now in a human, which makes things tricky. And so there, that person, Adira, wants to like tell them all of the stuff that, that Admiral, the Admiral knows, but can't because it's not actually a trill body with a trill symbiote. So um, that's really, that's going to be an, an interesting new thing to follow. Uh, so I don't know where that's going to lead us. I, I kind of suspect we won't be seeing Titan uh, as cool as that would be, but um, I'm again, sure we have yeah. some wild adventures again. <laughs> well, before we go to the wild adventure, one of the scenes I truly love in this, in this episode is the scene where they show uh, Earth and they show a city called San Francisco, which is where I am right now. Right. So you see the Golden Gate. I you saw the Golden Gate. Know? I was excited that the golden gate still exists because i feel like in so many science fiction uh franchises the golden yeah. gate is one of like the favorites to destroy immediately like let's crash ships into it let's move it let's Godzilla, hit, it, hit it with a tsunami you know whatever it, it seems to always be taken down so when they pull back from that shot and there's the golden gate i was like oh yay we didn't destroy the golden gate in a thousand years <laughs> yes yeah, so i look at the details too the presidio is still there the park the hills of San Francisco, the level of water is the same. I noticed that. Oh, well, that's it. So, that's interesting. Well, you know, I mean, in the timeline where Starfleet exists, or at least has existed, then, um, you know, it, it definitely is a, a place where people would have worked together to combat climate change. And I know that's, I know that's going to cause some comments. So No, we'll but it's also possible that they learn how to geo geoform a planet, like modify the atmosphere to go back to an atmosphere stable. I mean, this technology that they have will probably allow them to do more complex, uh, big scale project at the scale of, the, of a planet. So changing the atmosphere of the planet to make sure that it remains stable no matter what. It's, it's one of the solutions for climate change. Well, and they did say that they're self-sustaining. So obviously they've, they've managed to do something where they're, they're not overusing resources to the point of having to get them from someplace else. So that's, I mean, in theory right now, Earth is self-sustaining, but we also know that we're kind of going through a lot of material and how long that self-sustaining. Yeah. Well, I just remind people that in calculations show that in August, basically, we have used all the resources of our planet. Oh, so wow. We live with basically more, we use more resources our planet can provide after August as a civilization. So, this is an interesting conversation that maybe we're going to have again when they are going to mention Earth. And the last scene I like, and that's because I'm very kind of a hippie somehow, is to see 
with the tree. The and, tree uh, was when, so sweet. <laughs> when they go back and they basically see the tree they used to stay underneath for when they were students. So over there, 900 X, uh, exactly, 938 years ago. I just remind you that even if it seems to be a long period of time, trees can live quite a long time. I mean, we have trees on Earth that, which are, uh, uh, I look online yesterday, uh, one of the oldest tree known is Prometheus, but well, was mm -hmm. Prometheus, he got cut, and his age was 4,862 4, years. That's right, and, and in fact, in the Bay Area, we have redwoods that are obviously very long-lived and very old. So it's not surprising to find a thousand year old tree. I did like the fact that they were all, it's so big now. <laughs> <laughs> so that, I don't that know was what, cool. it be, what it could be for someone to go back on the planet 900 years later. It must be uh, kind of, uh, they, they mentioned that as well in the show at the beginning where they realized that the 900 years in the future and everybody they know are gone. Mm -hmm. is gone. Everybody, everything they care about is gone. It's basically is they are they are now in a new galaxy. You know? They 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 bring up a couple of interesting points about that. So one of you know they're talking about how every you know everybody they knew has lived their lives and is gone, and they never really had a chance to to mm -hmm. deal with that because um, to them you know it's it's an instantaneous trip through a wormhole. Um, at, but for everybody else, obviously you know. A, thousand year a millennia nearly a millennia has gone by so yeah the everything is vastly different and one of the things that Saru says when he's trying to convince them that why their ship is the way that it is is that you know they're descendants of the original crew mm -hmm. and you know we talk about that sometimes when we discuss the potential for interstellar travel is that you know if we did that even not now, obviously not now because we don't have anything that can go nearly, you know, a decent percentage of the speed of light. But in the future, if we did, you know, you're still looking at crews that would have to be multi-generational and that you would have to pass down the ship because you're, you know, you can't get someplace in a hundred years with the same people that yeah. you started off with. So it was interesting that Saru brought that up as a potential, you know, Excuse. reason. Yeah. You know, reason for their existence and for why they don't know what's going on that they've really been that far out and you know i like i you know no one's buying it <laughs> like, no one's no one's buying what he's selling uh, he's trying but i mean everybody's looking at him like all yeah, right they, they we're just gonna let it the, go <laughs> the, the 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 ship looks like new i mean there is a lot of anomalies that doesn't fit really the, the narrative of uh, a, civil, um, a crew of a six generation of a crew coming back to Earth. I have a right. question I mean, for you. If you go back sure. to Earth 900 years later, what will you do? If I were to come back to Earth 900 years, I mean, first off, cool. Second off, um, what would I do first? I would probably find the nearest library because I'm, I'm that person and I would want to know everything I could. So, okay. yeah, so you I, be in, bury yourself in books and, and on internet. Uh, or yeah, I, I doubt it would be paper books by that point. But yeah, I would definitely be you know reading whatever type of tablet or whatever sort of tech I had available. That would be what I would be doing. I would want to catch up on on as much as possible quickly as possible. Okay. I, I I definitely that's that's just who I am. I'd want to know like what's happened. <laughs> I will see. I will go see myself. I will basically travel in places that I know and see what happened to those places. And maybe see my, a place where I grew up to see what happened to my descendant. Kind of curious. That would be, I mean, years is a long time. It's a lot of people. So. It, it is. It is a lot of people, and especially for a spacefaring uh, civilization. You yeah. know, everybody's families are going to not be from the same places anymore you know it, not everybody can come from a vineyard in France and uh, so you know you'll probably see a lot of people from from outer planets and you know something like Titan yeah so it that would be that but I would want to know all of that I don't know as I would I would want to track through 900 years of genealogy to find out what happened but uh, if it were easy I might do it but that's a lot of generations that's a lot of family tree branches to kind of dig through 
So I, I mean, I'm trying to do my ge genealogy going back from now, and it's it's hard. <laughs> oh, yeah. And that's just 200 years worth. I can't imagine trying to go back any farther than that. So yeah, okay. I'm, I'm for the library. You're for roaming the world and looking at all, all the places yes. that you lived. Exactly. To see the so change I'd, with my yeah. own eye. That's why when I go to see the tree, I kind of relate to them because that's exactly the kind of stuff I will do. <laughs> I mean, I, I know that it's gonna be kind of wildly different because even where I grew up as a kid, now, um, just in that ensuing, you know, several decades, it's so different from when I grew up there. Um, we had a huge construction and population boom after I graduated from high school. And the area surrounding where I grew up is, is unrecognizable. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, I, the, uh, the thought of looking at it in a thousand years, you know, I mean, a thousand years ago where I grew up, it was prairie. And, you know, now it's, it's just built everywhere. So to think about That's what it's why like I was in surprised a thousand years. To see that San Francisco the, had not changed that much. Man. Right? Yeah. I mean, the architecture was different and everybody recognized it as being Starfleet headquarters, but it, it wasn't at the same time. Yeah. I mean, I would, I'm definitely one of those ones where I would like to take a few minutes and kind of like do some side by side comparisons and see what the, you know, the way they've, the designs have changed because I'm sure they're, again, you know, this is a show that is is known for its Easter eggs for these kinds of things, and and they do kind of take down those details. So I'd I'd be curious as to lay out some stuff. I didn't look into it. I don't like to do it too much, but um, I think now I'm I might go sit and and see what the differences are between now and then, just to kind of get a feel for it. All right. Well, I see you next week. For this week, we're late to this week. I'm so, we are sorry for that, by the we're, way. We're we're sorry for that. It turns out that we don't have working. Um, you know, Star Trek medical equipment. And when I get a migraine, I can't just have it zapped away. So um, it took me a couple of days to recover. And then obviously the beginning of the week. And then I have very the normal beginning internet. of the week. I had very poor internet where I was located. So I'm still hoping that Starlink will let me uh, get good <laughs> internet wherever I am because it will be very <laughs> practical. It will allow me to, uh, to, get, to do this kind of uh, discussion with you, even in the countryside. I was exactly. observing this weekend, so that's the reason, too. I mean, that sounds like fun, and we'll definitely, I'm sure Frank will have some great photos for me to put up on Instagram later on, because I, I know you, you've captured a bunch of images from the weekend, so yeah. um, we'll definitely have those. Uh, if you guys, like, want to tell us in the comments where you would go if you were to come to Earth 900 years in the future, what would be the first thing that you would do? I think that would be really interesting to see. I want to see, like, more of your thoughts on kind of those sorts of questions. Um, would you would you move to Titan in, and live in a colony there, that, or even Mars? Um, I'm kind of curious as to what our viewers think at this point. Frank, did you have any last words before I, I sign us off? No, thank you. And uh, see you uh, in a few days to talk about wherever this spaceship is going. I'm curious. <laughs> All right. So that's it. We'll be back next week. Well, actually, we'll be back this week. Uh, don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell for notifications. Feel free to leave a comment or five or six or 10 dozen with your thoughts and questions. Hopefully soon we'll, we'll take some questions and answer them. And uh, once again, thanks for watching, everybody. Have a great rest of the week.